Morning, morning, our brothers and sisters. Great to see you and welcome to worship. Recently, I've been uh, receiving some text messages, and some of you might have noticed um, there's an update in the church Facebook, or the church name has been mentioned in some news article. But uh, I want to say we are all good. The church is good. Uh, precautions measures have been made before and after. So thanks God and praise God. And I also want to add to that it is. Um, we praise God no matter what, no matter when. We praise God in good times and in bad times. We thank God also in good times and in bad times. Our praise to God never ceases. So I want to begin our worship today with this Psalm 117. Praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol Him, all you peoples. For great is His love towards us. And the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise, praise the Lord. Let's begin our Sunday praise. Our Sunday praise to Him. Glorious.
Jesus, God. Nothing can hold you. You break through the power of sin and death in order to hold us, to hold us in the palm of your hand. But as we thank you for the love, we thank you for the great things, the unexpected thing that you've done on the cross for us. Every day we count on your blessings, Lord Jesus. Every breath is a blessing. Every inhale and exhale is a blessing. Every moment we sit at a computer, in front of the computer, we cook in the kitchen, we eat takeaway, we talk to our beloved, it's also a blessing. Lord Jesus, help us, help us to turn our eyes upon you. Help us to turn at your grace, at your cross this morning. Transform us so we're not just living, we're not just living, but alive, alive in you, alive in the words that you taught us, alive in every teaching, alive in every action and thought. So Lord, just help us and be with us this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Okay, good morning, everyone. So last week, we just finished our uh, um, sermon series, The Lord's Prayer, and we are starting a new one. Today is entitled, The Kingdoms, right? And so I'm wearing, <laughs> I'm wearing this crown, not because my name is king, but just to start up this new series, uh, new sermon series entitled, The Kingdoms. But before that, uh, before I talk about this, um, I need some two volunteers with social distancing. We are very few here in the church, so let's use the people who also sang. <laughs> so, Eka, can you please step, step forward? And then one more person. Um, yes, Gary? Okay. When I was a kid, there was this game. I, I was so competitive. Actually, until now, I'm still competitive in many ways. <laughs> and it's entitled Shaggy D, Shaggy D, Shapopo. It's a game, so we will sing shaggy di, shaggy di, sha po po, shaggy di, shaggy di, sha po po. So we will say that all together. One, two, three, go. Shaggy di, shaggy di, sha po po, shaggy di, shaggy di, sha po po. And then I will do an action. For example, shaggy di, shaggy di, sha po po. And then after this one, Loreka will follow with. And so let's let's so let's instruct Gary. So let, example, shaggy di, shaggy di, sha po po, shaggy di, shaggy di, sha po po. Shaggy di, shaggy di, sha po po. Shaggy di, shaggy di, sha po po. And then it goes until, so it's like a um, wave of actions. Okay, are you ready? And the one who cannot follow will be out. So, so usually we played it with the 20s and 10s. And I always win because I'm really competitive. So let's see if you can beat me today. Okay. <laughs> One, two, three, go. Shaggy di, shaggy di, sha po po. Shaggy di, shaggy di, sha po po. Shaggy di, shaggy di, sha po po. Shaggy di, shaggy di, sha po. Oh, why are you following? Oh, Gary is out. Because you need to follow Loreka. Okay, thank you so much. We cannot play this whole time. <laughs> so in our life, it's something like this. There is always a leader and we follow them. And today we are starting a new sermon series entitled The Kingdoms. And uh, you know what? Even in our daily lives, we are following certain people. We have leaders in the church. We have leaders in our countries, in our communities. And we are always in that decision that, are we go am I going to follow this person? Is he doing the right thing? And so God is reminding us that 
we should also be careful in the people that we are following because it will affect our daily lives and how we see our communities. And you know what? Even in the Bible, biblical times, in the biblical times, the Israelites, um, they have God as their king, but they are like, we want someone who we can see. And so God answered them, okay, I will send you leaders and I will send you kings. But then in these next weeks, we will be looking at these kings and these kingdoms. And so today, may I just have this time for us to pray for our leaders and for the kings, because this is such a difficult time handling this pandemic, and I know that they need prayers. So shall we just offer this time to pray also for our kings and leaders? Lord, we praise you and thank you for being our king, the king of kings and the lord of lords. And Lord God, as we remember the kingdoms in the old biblical times, we also remember our present leaders. And today, we pray for them. Give them the knowledge. Give them the wisdom. Give them the right thing to do during this very difficult time in this world. And Lord God, anoint them. And may you work in their hearts. hearts. Even some of them, they don't believe in the power of the real king. I pray, Lord God, that you anoint them so that this world will feel that heaven that you wanted us to be in. So we may experience heaven here on earth and may we experience your glory, Lord God, through these leaders. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Well done, King. Thank you for this uh, wonderful message. And um, not only that, in a moment when you go to the, the uh, uh, video notice, uh, you will see a bit of highlight. Uh, this is the, uh, the uh, summer school of VBS for children. Um, I just like to highlight the fact that you know, even though the ministries of our church and many churches are being stop and go, stop and go, we're trying to do as much as we can to uh, serve, um, serve people, serve you all as a city um, as much as we can through distance, uh, through Zoom and other online things. So, and you can still be part of it. Uh, the first thing is Alpha. Um, the graphics is out, I believe, on the website. Um, if not, uh, we'll soon be out. Download it, forward it, and invite people. Download, forward, and invite. Um, and better yet, join the team. And if there's anything you, you, know, you can do uh, and you're afraid you, you can't join or you, can't, or you don't know this or that, you, know, you can always pray. So download, forward, invite, join the team, and pray. Alpha, okay. And then there's also a new um, a summer fellowship uh, starting tomorrow night. Um, just to add a, 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 a one more connection point, a connecting point with people as we are um, uh, feeling a bit disconnected ongoingly. So just pay attention to those in the video notices. Welcome to the Methodist International Church. Here are today's notices.
我搞掂苏浩走。你死咗喺邊啊？究竟我死咗去邊呢？查實大家有冇諗過，你死咗去邊都係一個好有意義嘅問題嚟呢？世界上面有好多人都曾經問過呢一個問題。好多人都好想知道，当我哋两脚一伸之后会点呢？唔通真系去埋咸鸭蛋？假设我哋成世人有七十年命，每一年用一个菠萝包嚟代表，我哋大约会花咗二十年时间摊喺床上面瞓觉，十一年花咗喺工作上面。十八年半攞嚟睇电视同埋上网，六个月去等红绿灯，数下数下，其实剩翻落嚟有几多真系可以用嘅时间呢？你嘅生命可能仲有三十六万八千个钟头，我哋想花少过廿四个钟喺启发呢一度，同大家一齐探索人生嘅意义。伙计埋单啦，唔该。The first Bible reading today is taken from the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 17, verses 1 to 4 and 8 to 18. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle. They were gathered at Soko, which belongs to Judah, and encamped between Sogo and Azekah in Avastamim. Saul and the Israelites gathered and encamped in the valley of Elah and formed ranks against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, with a valley between them. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cupids and a span. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, Today I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now David was the son of an Ephrathite of Bethlehem in Judah, named Jesse, who had eight sons. In the days of Saul, the man was already old and advanced in years. The three eldest sons of Jesse had followed Saul to the battle. The names of his three sons who went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, and next to him, Abinadab, and the third, Shammah. David was the youngest. The three eldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. For 40 days, the Philistine came forward and took his stand morning and evening. Jesse said to his son David, take for your brothers an ephah of this parched grain and these ten loaves and carry them quickly to the camp to your brothers. Also take these ten cheeses to the commander of their thousand. See how your brothers fare 
and bring some token from them. Our second reading is from the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 17, verse 20, verses 22 to 55. David rose early in the morning, left the sheep with a keeper, took the provisions, and went as Jesse had commanded him. He came to the encampment as the army was going forth to the battle line, shouting the war cry. David left the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage, ran to the ranks, and went and greeted his brothers. As he talked with them, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came up out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before, and David heard him. 
all the Israelites, when they saw the man, fled from him and were very much afraid. The Israelites said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. The king will greatly enrich the man who kills him and will give him his daughter and make his family free in Israel. David said to the man who stood by him, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? The people answered him in the same way, So shall it be done for the man who kills him. His eldest brother, Eliab, heard him talking to the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. He said, Why have you come down? With whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption and the evil of your heart, for you have come down just to see the battle. David said, What have I done now? It was only a question. He turned away from him toward another and spoke in the same way, and the people answered him again as before. When the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul, Saul and he sent for him. David said to Saul, Let no one's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with the Philistine. Saul, Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are just a boy, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servants used to keep sheep for his father. And whenever a lion or a bear came and took a lump from the flock, I went after it and struck it down, rescuing the lump from its mouth. And if it turned against me, I would catch it by the jaw, strike it down and kill it. Your servant has killed both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, since he has defied the armies of the living God." David said, The Lord who saved me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will save me from the hand of the Philistine. So Saul said to David, Go, and maybe the Lord be with you. Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a bronze helmet on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. David strapped Saul's sword over the armor, and he tried in vain to walk for he was not used to them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot walk with this, for I am not used to them. So David removed them. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the wadi and put them in his shepherd's bag in his pouch. His sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. The Philistine came on and drew near to David, with his shield bearer in front of him. When the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. The Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the field. But David said to the Philistine, You come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I came to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This very day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head." And I will give the dead bodies of the Philistine army this very day to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the earth, so that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and all that this assembly may know that the Lord does not save by sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. When the Philistine drew nearer to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. 
David put his hand in his bag, took out the stone, slung it, and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and stone, striking down the Philistine and killing him. There was no sword in David's hand. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine. He grasped his sword, drew out its sheath, and killed him. Then he cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. The troops of Israel and Judah rose up with a shout and pursued the Philistines as far as Gath and the gates of Ekron, so that the wounded Philistines fell on the way from Sha'arim as far as Gath and Ekron. The Israelites came back from chasing the Philistines, and they plundered their camp. David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in his tent. When Saul saw David go out against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the commander of the army, Abner, whose son is this young man? Abner said, as your soul lives, O king, I do not know. This is the word of the Lord. Goliath was a mighty man. He stood over ten feet tall. Goliath was a mighty man. He had a lot of gall. He laughed at David and David's son. He made fun of all King Saul. Goliath was a mighty man, but you should have seen him fall. Five, four, four, three, five, four, four. Goliath five, was a four, mighty man. Well, thank you so, so much for Jacqueline and Gary who uh, sent this amazing song for us. I can almost hear you guys like clapping from your, you know, at home watching this. And, and thank you for King and even Cecilia who read this uh, dramatized version of this famous story. Uh, nothing in, the, you know, during the time of 
suffering and pandemic and you know, lockdown. I think uh, what a great gift we have um, in creativity and art to keep us, uh, keep our spirit uh, alive and going. Uh, thank you. Thank you for all of your um, effort. Well, today um, we're starting a new series, uh, a stories. It's called the Stories of the Kingdom. Well, over the next five weeks, we will survey the period of monarchy to the exile of Israel by looking at five stories that we've chosen. If you still remember, uh, our preaching this year, this whole year, is set on the theme, God the Father King, and we've been on a journey to overview the Bible from cover to cover, looking at God's reign and his kingdom as its central theme. And back in March, we closed the previous series called Father of the Promised Kingdom with the story of 1 Samuel chapter 8. You know, all the way, we see all the way through the period of Judges, um, <clears throat> God has always been Israel's king, but, re- but Israel has rejected and kept on rejecting God's kingship and demanded for a human king instead. God wanted Israel to be a holy nation, but Israel just wanted to be like any other nations around them, to have a human monarchy. And despite God's warning through Samuel, they insisted on the one demand, and finally God gave them what they wanted. And today, we will pick up from that storyline and see how it continues, starting with the story uh, that is very familiar to all of us, the story of David and Goliath. Now, for those of you who know a little bit of, of the history of the Bible, you know that you know, David is not actually the first king that God has given Israel. It's Saul. And uh, you may be asking, why do we skip over Saul and so many other great stories in between and chose this to be the starting one? And also, in a sense, this story is the chosen story of Israel as well. Uh, although you know, David enters the Bible and enters the story of the kingdom of Israel uh, actually in the preceding chapter, and there, uh, David was, you know, he's a fine musician, he's a shepherd boy. Uh, God actually explicitly said that David is the chosen king to replace Saul. However, whenever Israel talks about the rise of David and the rise of this golden age of the kingdom of Israel, this story in this chapter is always the one that they go back to. And even though Saul was the first king that opened up the monarchy period for Israel, it's always David who is remembered as the quintessential ideal king. He's always the one who's seen as the most important king, not only by Christians, but also by Jews and Muslims. Why is that the case? Why is this story so special? Why should we bother reading it? And why is this still so relevant for us today? Uh, non-Jews, even in a world that is so fed up with violence and tensions and animosity. So these questions of why is exactly what we're going to focus on today. And we're going to answer them in three simple points, three reasons. It is because this story is memorable, it's relatable, and it's insightful. It's memorable, it's relatable, and it's insightful. So first, this story is memorable. Um, It's memorable because it's so dramatic. It's it's cinematic. It's got all the elements of a Hollywood superhero movie, right? First, we've got this description of Goliath, which we actually didn't read. um, Otherwise, it's just way too long. He's this over... Eight feet tall, or the song goes ten feet tall, supersized heavyweight warrior dressed in full gear. And the armor itself is over 125 pounds. And that's without the shield, which required another person, a shield bearer, to carry. I mean, it's ridiculous. Not only that, uh, Robert Alter, an American professor of Hebrew and comparative literature, uh, he wrote a book almost tw- over 20 years ago now, um, called The David Stories. The David Story, which is a translation with comments on 1 and 2 Samuel. It's a, it's a classic masterpiece to which I owe a lot in this sermon. And uh, 
In his comment, Otto actually, um, he pointed out, he speaks of the, the spatial definition or the horizontal perspective of this narrative. In just the beginning few verses, you, you've, we've got this standstill of the armies on opposite, opposite hilltops facing each other. And then we've got this valley in between, which is really a ravine, uh, a deep and narrow canyon, as altered, translated. And then we've got Goliath, this champion of the Philistine, and the word champion there in Hebrew literally reads, the man between. That is the man who goes out in between the opposite battle lines to fight a counterpart. The man between. And the use of this word just adds so much to this spatial definition, this extreme opposition of the scene. And then this man, be man between comes forward and down, presumably slowly and clumsily, descending all the way to the bottom of this ravine in the middle, in which everyone, every single soldier can see. It's like a gladiator entering into a Roman costume. And then the insulting trash talk, which I love, you know. And then, it's, it's, and then the challenge of the duel and uh, the battle cry. I mean, even today in our reading, we didn't read a lot of the back. At the, we didn't actually read the battle scene. I believe most of us do remember its epic ending. It's a perfect script that sets the stage for a perfect spectacle. It's epic, it's cinematic, it's memorable. That's the first point. But secondly, this story is relatable. As the story goes, uh, David's father, Jesse, uh, he had eight sons. His three oldest sons follow, uh, already followed Saul in battles, and David is actually the youngest of eight. And he spent his days uh, you know, between chores, you know, tending the flock, the sheep, and delivering things, cheese and milk and whatever, you know, bread to his brothers in the front line, the battlefield. And then in his spare time, he plays good music. In a sense, you know, he, he plays music uh, in, um, he's like a music therapist in Saul's court, royal court, to soothe Saul from his evil spirit. We know this from the previous chapter. And Saul being the head of state, and being a head taller than everyone. If there's anyone who should go out to face Goliath, he should be the one. <laughs> I mean, after all, he's the king, and in those days, that's what kings do. To go out in the front to fight the battles that must be fought, but no one else is, is willing to fight. And he goes out there and charge forward and wins the victory for the people. But instead, here, Saul's actions have led the nations into fear more than anything else. And who would have thought that in the end it is this baby brother, you know, this music therapist, this shepherd boy and delivery boy, and with a slingshot and just one stone who could make the giant fall, right? Maybe even David himself was also surprised that it he only did it with one stone, not five. I think most of us can relate to stories like this. You know, we, we all have some giants in our lives, some battles that makes us feel overpowered and defeated, some Goliaths that, uh, that, that, is, that is keep on taunting us and belittling us, bullying us and enslaving us. But we also know that even though you know, some giants just seem too big to fall, Sometimes, the little guys, you know, the underdog, <laughs> could somehow, against all odds, manage to beat those Goliaths, those giants, and become some unexpected heroes. Now, some of you may have experienced it yourself personally. Maybe you are one of those unsung or unexpected heroes once or many times. But we all, and we all know th those emotional moments that comes from those impossible victories. So this story is chosen because it's relatable. Stories of great threat and great defeat and the impossible victories. 
And if we ask ourselves, and what is the takeaway from this story? I think most of us would say that this is about how we just need a little bit of faith, a little seed of faith like David in facing our giants, our Goliaths, you know, in our valleys. We identify ourselves with David and try to be like him. And with our current situations with the pandemic, and obviously the common enemy, the most common one is this COVID-19, this virus that we are all struggling to defeat together. You know, the story says Goliath taunted Israel for 40 days. You know, we have been taunted and defeated by this just strange virus for over 40 days, much longer than that. And, you know, many of us are tired. We're wondering, you know, is it going to end? When's it going to end? And we're doubting that, you know, how many more waves do we have to face? It, it can get depressing. It's scary. And we do need stories like this to encourage us. While we face this common enemy, this giant, this, giant, this virus, I also know that, you know, this fight can come in different forms and shapes. Maybe your parents struggling to take care of your kids at home. Maybe you've you know, you're trying to stay focused and be productive at work, and it's, it's, not, it's the constant struggle in making contingency plan. Maybe if you've, you've lost your job, you don't know what's gonna, you know, how long it's going to take for you to find another job, whatever. I wonder what sort of giants you're facing. What is making you feel defeated, taunted, and being put to shame? And your faith even is being put to shame. And I pray, and we pray here at MIC, that each day you will find that childlike faith, that godly courage of David to face whatever giants that you're facing at the moment. We really do. However, when I read this story this time, it dawned on me how I've missed some really important things. It's the human side of David. Uh, yeah, you know, yes, I know that episode, I think we all know the episode with Bathsheba and uh, Uriah, which happened later in his life, but I'm actually talking about this particular story here, this particular chapter. There are things we can see here about the personality of this young lad that aren't necessarily wrong or sinful, but they aren't particularly godly or childlike either. And these things are often you know, glossed over or easily missed, at least I did in the past when I read. And here's a few examples. First, have you noticed that after David heard from one, one of the soldiers what the reward would be for defeating Goliath, David actually asked two other sources about it again. You know, why did he do that? Was he trying to fact check it and make doubly sure you know, what he heard about the reward was true? Let's look at another one. After David delivered the provisions to his, uh, uh, that his father has asked him, he was supposed to just leave and go back to tend his flock, his sheep that he left behind, right? But instead, he ran to the ranks and made all those inquiries about the rewards. And when his oldest brother told him all, his response was, what have I done now? It's just a question. <laughs> the, sibling, the sibling rivalry is obvious here. And, you know, we get the impression that he gets picked on by his older brothers a lot. And, as it turns out, it wasn't just a question. He was on to something, right? And what about this? What about his wit and his rhetorical skills? When he finally got to meet Saul, uh, he, he started by saying, let no man's hearts fail. Let no one's hearts fail. Well, Saul's heart was failing, definitely, based on the narrative of the stories. But David was tactful enough to not to point out the obvious to embarrass the king. And he was also tactful enough to not to embarrass himself. When Saul tried to put his armor on David, David said, well, I'm not used to these. Well, of course, the obvious fact is those are way too big for David because he's way too small. But David didn't state that obvious fact. 
He's just not used to it. <laughs> After David told Saul the unbelievable, unbelievable account of how he had fought lions and bears with his bare hands and rescued his, his sheep from the jaws, like Saul paused, paused, like not knowing what to say or to believe in response to these unbelievable accounts. Then, at that moment, David sort of, you know, just made one little step forward and closed his argument by bringing God into the equation, into his argument. God will save me. The God of Israel will fight. Well, David might very well be a you know, godly, God-trusting and courageous little young lad, but he's definitely uh, good in speaking. He definitely knows how to speak and persuade, and he definitely knows all the right things to say. And what about this one? Have you noticed when David persuaded Saul to let him fight, actually he made no mention of his plan of attack, his strategy, or his secret weapon at all, as if he was really just going to go out and fight in the name of God. And humanly speaking, David was actually talking Saul into putting the fate of the whole nation into a slingshot. And... <laughs> And the Hebrew word that Saul used to refer to David at the end of the story is, you know, often translated as young lad. And, and Robert Alter, in his translation, he used the word stripling. <laughs> stripling. I didn't know what this word means. I looked it up. Which is, you know, strip, stripling is a word, uh, which is, is a word uh, that you use to, uh, in a slightly humorous way to say that although someone is no longer a boy, he's not yet a real man. Could it be true that this stripling also in his heart have this desire to show to the world that although he's not a real man, he's definitely not a boy anymore? You see, you know, we, if we put all these details, this human side of David together, it begs the imagination that you know, if the opportunity presents itself in which David can prove he's, he's able, this kid would most definitely seize that opportunity. So this story portrays a lot about you know, the human side of David. He's witty, he's resourceful and shrewd, he calculates, he knows how to speak and what to say. He was often belittled by a lot of people almost all the time because he's small, but he's street smart. These things aren't necessarily wrong or sinful, but don't, they don't seem particularly godly or childlike as uh, we often imagine David to be. At least how we present him in, in children's Sunday school. So I asked myself, how did I miss all this in the past when I read this story? How come I didn't see all of this, this human side uh, as we read this story? And why we read, we read this story the way we, we used to read it, the way we, we did? And what relevant does it make, especially when you know, we live in a world so sick and tired of the you know, issue of race and tribalism, and animosity, and the escalating tension between the nations, and most, most of all, violence. What are we to make of this, this rather actually violent and graphic stories? And this takes us back to the, the original question of why. Why is this the story, not the preceding one that is often being associated with the rise of David, the rise of this golden age of the kingdom of Israel? Why is this story preserved for us here today? Non-Jews, non-Israelites. And this is actually the third and final point. Because this story is insightful. This story is here to make us ask exactly these questions. And through this questioning, to review to us some insights into our own human condition. To show that the battle or the enemy He's not just always out there, but also within, at home, and even in our hearts. As we read the story and try to dissect the meaning and see what David is, David is made of, this story is also reading us, dissecting us, and showing us what we are made of. I mean, that's the wonder, wonderful thing about the Bible, this double-edged sword, the Word of God. You know, as we overview the Bible, the Bible is showing us some close-up views of ourselves. 
Perhaps God wants to show us how hardwired we are in our yearning for a great king, a great leader, a hero who won't disappoint, a leader who is righteous and mighty, how we tr- and how we try to fill that yearning with our fantasies, and we project those fantasies onto David and his stories. And God wants to show us what those fantasies are, to service our hidden leadership idols or political idols in order to wake us up and to set us free from them. Maybe God also wants to show us how certain leaders of our time, despite all their integrity issues, are actually being idolized as the chosen one, the the savior of their respective nations and even of the world in desiring our own version of an ideal leader, we can be so willing, so ready to excuse them of their failures and to bend them in to fit our fantasies, just like how Israel forged that golden calf in the wilderness. Whether you're a supporter of democracy or a more centralized form of government, whether you're, a supporter of a, you're, whether you're a capitalist or a socialist, an imperialist, or you support the idea of a, a republic, whether you, you dream of a secular, pluralistic society led by universal values or, and science, or you dream of probably the most dangerous idea of a Christian nation. Perhaps God wants to show us how, like Israel, who rejected God as their king and turned to human monarchy or And in our yearnings for a better world, a better future, we might have also in similar ways denied God and turned to our own human device, our own little systems of politics and ideologies and making them as our final hope. Maybe you think, you know, you don't have a problem with politics. But let me ask you this. Do you find yourself forbidding people, or do, do you find yourself like being sick and you just don't care about current affairs anymore? Or even you decide to forbid people to talk about politics? Are you too indifferent to even just what goes on in our neighborhood? You don't even watch the news? I, I know it can get depressing sometimes. Or do you always have to talk about politics? Are you getting too obsessed? You know, have you so bought into the leader or political ideas that you support that you can't even talk to or even sit with someone who disagrees with your views? And when, when leaders or you know, political parties that you support wins, or when the leaders or, or, or parties that you hate get sanctioned, you just get so happy up in the sky. And when the opposite happens, you just feel that the world is ending. Do you use your God-given civil rights and responsibilities on earth to make God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, in creative ways, in faithful ways, even in this time of challenging pandemic? You see, the gospel is not politically religious or apolitical. The gospel is, is not politically zealous, nor politically indifferent. And perhaps this story is here just to show us that because God also wants to, want to warn us of our own ego to play the hero sometimes in our desire to be like David. Showing us how to, you know, in our distorted heroism sometimes we can justify our folly and our childishness. And worse still, in trying to be like David, sometimes we start to become more like Goliath or end up becoming the monster we set out to defeat. Sometimes the real Goliath is our very self. The real enemy is is our stand, our perspective. And the battle is about, you know, sometimes actually the battle is more about disarming, surrendering, not fighting and overcoming. Maybe it is more about, you know, our need to be actually defeated so that we can be brought to a place where we will admit that we are wrong. And we will say, we don't know. We don't know better. 
We don't have all the facts. We are not sure. This is my provisional view for now. So as, as we live in this information age or misinformation age, you know, every day we are caught in this battle of perspective. And it will become increasingly so, especially last week we, you know, we heard Pompeo announced you know, this clean network campaign aiming to cut off the internet between China and Hong Kong versus the rest of the world. Maybe more and more, what we perceive and receive about what's going on in the world, our sense of reality will become more and more divided. And we are all slaves to the, inf the information that we have access to or fed with, which shapes and forms our perspective, our opinion, our prejudices, our own sense of right and wrong and good or bad. I believe maybe God wants to show us our need to be right and our need to be seen to be right, our desire to be good without God can sometimes be that greater enemy and the deepest slavery from which we need rescue. That is the worst enemy. Perhaps it's all of the above. I don't know what God is trying to say as he holds up this mirror of scripture in front of us, in front of you today, through this story. How great and how deep is our spiritual sedition our spiritual subversion against the kingdom of God and how desperately we need to be saved from ourselves. And what we need is a king. What we really need is a king who is strong enough and bold enough to defeat the giants that are out there and at the same time gracious and forgiving enough to disarm the giants within. A king who can right the wrongs out there as well as inside a king who can save us from ourselves who can deliver us from both evil out there and inside in our the most secret corners of our soul a king who can slay and make alive a king who can deliver and give us the bread that can fulfill our insatiable desire for power and dominance and righteousness and can heal us from our sickness of self-righteousness and self-exaltation. We need a king who is truly passionate for seeing God's name being honored. But where do we find such a king? Even a great king like David won't do. We need one greater than David. And at the end of the story here, Saul asked, Whose son is this? And years later, this same question was asked of Jesus Christ, who came down to the battleground, to the center stage of the world, not to fight with violence and might, but with grace and mercy, to mediate, to reconcile by suffering accusation and take on the rightful charges and punishments that you and I deserve. He's the one who right, he's the, he's the one who is right, but he's wrong and misjudged. So that we who are we, who often misjudged and who are often wrong can be set right with God and with one another. And because of him, this story matters to us because it, it points to this great king, the son of David, the son of God the one who rules over all and sees all. And the amazing good news is this. Even though he sees all the insights into us and he knows everything about us, all our flaws and imperfections, our hidden desires, he come and relate to us. He identify with us. And he's able to come down and bring down those giants out there and disarm those giants within us. And therefore, he will always be remembered as the true and better king, greater than David and all the kings of this world. And this battle, because of him, becomes relevant to us because of his final battle on the cross against the power of sin and death itself, which is the battle we all must fight, but we couldn't fight. But Jesus won it by suffering defeat and death alone himself 
and brought about the rise of the ultimate kingdom that we all dream of, the kingdom of God. You see the gospel? This is the gospel. The gospel says, at great cost to Jesus himself, he showed us that the final threat to the cosmic order is defeated and the governance of the world will be set right. And through him, our belonging in that ultimate future has already been secured. Therefore, we care about justice. We care about politics, current affairs, the state of the world. We care about the birds in the air, the animals in the field, the fish in the seas. And we will finally, when we see that, we will finally get back to the divine road of Adam and Eve that is supposed to be shared for, among all of us. And we're going to do it right this time with God. Not with our own ideas of how the world should be run, but with God, with the power and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit which He's bestowed us. Beginning, hopefully, in the church. And it radiates out to our society. Let me close. Colossians chapter 1 and 2 says, Christ has disarmed the powers and authorities and made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross, by making peace through the blood of his cross and in his fleshly body through death. Not other people's sons, he doesn't send other people to war. He himself takes on the greatest battle so that in him all things are held together and through him all things are reconciled to God. Even thrones and dominions of rulers and powers of this world and all the world to come in the future and all the kingdoms have come in the past, everything is reconciled. And even us who were once estranged and hostile to God himself, the enemy of God against God himself, we are also reconciled. Jesus Christ, the ultimate champion, the man between heaven and earth, the man between you and who you think as your worst enemy is. And we're in a moment, I'm going to sing a song in response. We'll celebrate, we'll remember how great Jesus is.
Let us spend a time to pray together, to intercede for the world, for the church, beginning with ourselves today. Oh, Jesus Christ, you are our ultimate champion, our ultimate man, between reconciling all things together. We lift up ourselves Christians, our church, MIC, and the churches of Hong Kong, and the church worldwide, that we might be part of that great mission of reconciliation. Yes, while we are, we're tired, we are a bit low because of this ongoing virus that taunts us and makes us feel a bit depressed, but at the same time, we know that there are also battles within ourselves. And we pray you will search us and find us, help us to find ourselves so that we might become that agent of reconciliation that this divided world so desperately needs. Reveal those idols in us. Reveal our fantasies and obsessions bring to service and let this disarming power of Christ melt those idols, those golden calves, so that we can engage our energy back to your gospel and all its implications in our daily lives, even in our civil engagement. Help us be united by you and only by you. At the same time, we look to your power, God, to keep, keep us going, to keep us hanging in there, to fight this external Goliath, this COVID-19. Give us the extra mesh of strength. From strength to strength and grace to grace, may your church rise up to run this long marathon of service and love. Whether we are at home, whether we are still going to work on site, whether we have our own struggles of you know, career loss or whatever that is, God, strengthen us, comfort us. This week we especially remember the escalating tension between uh, communist China and the rest of the world, all these sanctions happening, 
all these campaigns. We remember the big explosion in Beirut. We remember all those things now that didn't make it to the headline this week, but somehow have caught our attention and bothering us. God, as we lift up all these things, we ask for your, your courage to help us to uh, engage in this world and turn to these things uh, with grace. So that in this enduring time, we can be found faithful, faithful witness of your grace and love and your power. May you surprise us like how David was surprised that despite of all our lackings, we somehow managed to find these extra resources that comes from you to serve this world. And when we discover that, we will give all the glory to you with our testimony. We will testify you among the nations. We will testify you with our families, with our friends, over Zoom, over you know, the internet. And we will give you all the glory, all the honor that is due you. For the kingdom and the power and glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. With that, let us um, continue and close our worship with this final hymn, Crown Him with Many Crowns.
God, here we are before you with all the giants that we face and all the hidden Goliaths in our lives. We present ourselves in Christ, holy and unblemished before you, seeking you to use us despite of all our flaws and failures and knowing that by the power of the Spirit, you will empower us and you, as you have been and you always be. So now, may the love of God the Father, who didn't spare his own son, may the love of our Lord Jesus Christ, our true shepherd king, and may the fellowship of this Holy Spirit, who both empowers us and searches us, be with us all, now and forever. Amen. we finish as Gary keep on playing I would like to make just one final announcement one final push of the women's retreat this coming Saturday so if uh, there are a lot of people sign ups already uh, there might be still some space left but don't worry if you want to join sign up and uh, we'll try to accommodate so God bless you all and have a great Sunday <laughs>